بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد So last Wednesday we had talked about the blessings of Medina or the city of Yathrib and the fadail, the ahadith, uh, the specialities that Allah Azza wa Jal and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have mentioned about the city of Medina Today we're going to continue on uh, and talk about the demographics of Medina who lived there and can we have any population estimate? The demographics of Medina. We all know that there were two major ethnic groups living in Medina. The Jewish tribes and the Arab tribes. So the first question we need to ask ourselves, where did these Jews come from? Where, what are they doing in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula? And then the second question, which Arabs are these? Where, how are they related to the other Arabs? And what is the relationship between the Yahud and the Arabs in Yathrib, in Medina? Realize, before we even begin, that this issue is a very politicized, very polemical one. It causes a lot of debate. And that is because... The accusation that non-Muslims uh, give of our religion, amongst many other accusations, one of them is that it is anti-Semitic. And anti-Semitic means that the accusation is the religion is racist against the Jewish people. And that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had certain inclinations to dis disregard uh, the Jewish people or to treat them in a negative manner. This is the accusation, right? And the way that the, tree, the three Jewish tribes were treated, the Banu Qurayla, the Banu Qaynuqa, the Banu Nadir, the way that these three Jewish tribes were treated one after the other, this is their basis for this accusation. Okay, so this is a very sensitive topic, and it is one that whenever, if you ever give da'wah to uh, non-Muslims, eventually this comes up. Number of things, the process of marrying multiple women, the age of Aisha, and then one of the most important things, how he dealt with the Yahudi tribes. Right. So when we talk about it in this context, especially in North America, we need to understand clearly what happened. Without being apologetic, by now all of you know me, that inshallah, you have no doubt, inshallah, I'm not an apologetic. I'm not an apologist. What is an apologist? Somebody who wishes to water down Islam and make it compatible or palatable to all the enemies of Islam. I don't care what people criticize Islam. If it is true, we will have to defend it and we have to believe it. And if it's not true, then we tell them it's not true. Right? So if they say that you guys do XYZ, XYZ is what we do, we say yes we do this. Whether you like it or not, this is our religion. Right? And if they lie about us, then we say no, this is not true. And if it is true, then we also have to explain. So did the Prophet have multiple wives? Yes, he did. Then we need to explain the rationale. There's wisdom behind it. And in explaining this, we are not watering Islam down. We're simply defending and we're simply explaining that people should not be critical. So. This is one of those topics, I'm just talking about it for the first time, but do realize that throughout the next few weeks and the next few years, because the Madani Seerah is three times the Makki Seerah, uh, inshallah if Allah gives us life, we'll continue this, I will have to go into a lot of detail into these Jewish relationships because it is important for American Muslims to be aware of the details of what happened some of which sound politically very incorrect and some of which have no problems with our basis is not political correctness our basis did the process of them do it if he did what is the wisdom that's what our methodology is going to be so before we even go on this tangent today we need to discuss a very important question that will contextualize the rest of this dimension and that is where did these Jews come from? And what are our sources for the stories about the Prophet and the Jews? Now realize one of the biggest problems that we face is that non-Islamic sources have no mention of these Jewish people at all. So the only reference we have to these tribes is from within the Islamic tradition. As of yet, we have not discovered any history, any chronicle that mentions the tribes in Medina. Now, there are references to Jews in Arabia, in other Islam, uh, sources. But from the Islamic sources, we get all of the details. Now, this is considered problematic by non-Muslims. For us, it doesn't really matter that much. By non-Muslims, it's considered problematic. Why? Because they say, these sources are biased. They all have an agenda. And what is the agenda? To defend the Prophet 
no matter at what cost. Because they're all Muslims, so they're not going to be fair and balanced. That's only one network is fair and balanced, right? Otherwise, the Muslims can never be fair and balanced, right? Because, according to them, they will have this bias to defend the Prophet ﷺ, so we'll never know the full story. Anybody who opposes the Prophet ﷺ, according to them, will be painted in a negative light. And can you believe there are articles that I have read myself that defend Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul as being a noble man, as being a leader. Why? Because, again, the point is, anybody who opposes the process of Mrs. Painted negatively, he must have been a good person. So they flip the entire narrative around. And they make the leader of the Munafiqeen the real, true gentleman and nobleman of Medina. And the same applies to the other stories as well. So we need to be very cautious and careful about how we're going to interpret the sources. So, we begin by saying there are a number of theories about where these Jewish tribes came from. Some of these theories were simply said by the early scholars and some are propounded by later scholars. The first theory is that these tribes were sent by the Prophet Musa salam himself. That the Prophet Musa salam sent a small group to the land of Hijaz. Why? Because he knew that the Prophet Muhammad would come from that land and so he wanted a group of his followers to believe in him and welcome him. This is a theory that one finds in early Islamic sources and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. It does seem a bit strange to be honest uh, and it doesn't seem very, uh, very sound. Yani why would Musa alayhi salam send some of his followers when he is the prophet of that time and the people should remain with him? And he knows that there's going to be another Prophet Isa between him and the Prophet Sallallahu And Allahu Alam, but he probably knew that the other Prophet would come after a long time. And that's over two, two three thousand years. Allahu Alam. But this is one theory that some Muslims have. Uh, another theory which seems more reasonable, and this actually might have some references in non-Islamic sources I will mention. Another theory is that the Jews of Medina settled in Medina after they were expelled from Jerusalem. Now, let's pause here. And, and, and everyone should know that once upon a time, Sulaiman alayhi salam, when Sulaiman was the king and Sulaiman was the prophet, all the Yehud, of course, were in Jerusalem. Obviously, that is very true. We don't deny this. It's obvious. They were, they were there. And Sulaiman alayhi salam had built the, the big temple, the Haikal. He had built the big temple of uh, Sulaiman. Now, over the course of the next hundreds and thousands of years, the power of that state collapsed. Uh, the Romans became in charge and then the Christians and at times even the Persian emperor was in charge of Jerusalem. So over the course of the next uh, 1,500 uh, years until Umar ibn al-Khattab conquered Jerusalem, Jerusalem was in between many different people. It was controlled by pagan Romans. Pagan Romans, they hated the Christians as well. It was controlled by the, the Persians at times, and at times it was controlled by Christian uh, Romans. So different groups had controlled it. Now, there were two major expulsions of the Jews. And according to the majority of scholars of Islam, it is these two expulsions that are mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Isra. If you read the first page of Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two expulsions and two punishments sent upon them. Right? The majority of Quranic scholars consider these two to have been the ancient two of the past. And I should just add as a footnote, some modern scholars of the Quran, and I don't, I haven't really studied and, and, and I don't have an opinion myself, some modern scholars say that this reference in Surah Al-Isra is to a future event and not a past one. And if you understand Surah Al-Isra, this changes the whole dynamics of what the Surah is talking about, right? And that is a tangent that is not relevant to this class. But there's a, a new group of scholars that is saying Surah Al-Isra is not history, it is prophecy. Surah Al-Isra is not the past, it is the future. And that changes the entire dynamics if you understand the surah and what is being mentioned. But that is one theory. The majority of scholars in our history have always understood Surah Al-Isra as being history. I.e. the two expulsions. What are these two expulsions? The first expulsion took place in 587 B.C. Before the Christian era. 587 B.C. 
And this was when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was an evil tyrant rule, Bukhta uh, Nasr uh, in Arabic, uh, Nebuchadnezzar surrounded Jerusalem and for the first time in the history of the Jewish uh, empire destroyed the Haikal of Suleiman, the original Haikal. The actual temple that Suleiman had built. And this was considered to be one of the wonders of the world. Why? Because the jinn built it, obviously. It was a structure the likes of which man had never seen. It was massive and beautiful. It was a, a, a feat of architecture. It was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You might have heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Seven, uh, uh, if you like, creations of man that were just unparalleled. One of them was reputed to be reputed to be the Haikal of Sulaiman. And of course, we as Muslims, we believe the reason why was because he had the jinn building him. Allah, Allah says in the Quran, right, uh, that the jinn are banna in wa gawas, right? That they were banna, architects and gawas, diving deep into the water to get what they needed. So they're doing things in the water. What did they get from the water? What pearls, what, what beautiful, exquisite treasures? And banna, they're building structures. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Sulaiman was given this. So the, the haikal of Sulaiman was a amazing structure that stood solid for four or five hundred years, untouched. And then Allah Azza wa Jal will that the first of the destructions occur. And this is, as I said, in 587 uh, BC. And this was when the original temple was destroyed. This temple was uh, when it was destroyed, it was the first time the Jews had to flee. It is called the uh, diaspora. And the Jews are known throughout history for having many diasporas. They, are, they, are, they call themselves the wandering people. The wandering peoples. Why? Because since that time, they've never had uh, a unified land up until, as, uh, as we know, 1947. So they have always been in different lands. Uh, that was the beginning, the first diaspora. And it was at that diaspora that large groups left for many lands. We know for a fact they went, the majority, uh, the majority of them went to Iran. And they stayed there for many decades or hundreds of years until finally King, uh, was it Cyrus, allowed them to come back. And so many of them came and many of them remained. And Iranian Jews, therefore, are considered to be of the most ancient of the Jews. And there are plenty still in the world. If you go to Los Angeles, there's a whole area of uh, Iranian Jews over there, an entire area over there where you can see their uh, restaurants and their uh, uh, um, stores and whatnot. And they're well known. This is perhaps one of the largest groups uh, of, Iran of uh, Jews in the Middle East before the creation of Israel. That was in Iran. So that, that's one area they went. Also they went to areas of Iraq. And we know that Iraq had a lot of Jews in the time of the uh, Umayyads. Uh, early Umayyads has, has, was full of Jews, Baghdad uh, as well, uh, Kufa and Baghdad. Where did they come from this first uh, diaspora? Uh, it is also said that some went to Yemen. But it appears that the majority of the Yemenite Jews are from the second expulsion, and Allah knows best. Were they, do they go back that ancient or not? We know that Yemen had a lot of Jews in it. We know this up until now. Uh, you know, they were Jews until 1947, and the Yemeni Jews and the Falasha of Ethiopia are, of course, related. They are, in fact, the same branch. So from Yemen, they then went to uh, Habash or Ethiopia. So those two are also the branch of the Yehud. So there is one theory that a small group of Jews in 587 BC emigrated to Hijaz. This is a theory. There is no architectural evidence. There's no uh, you know, records. This is one theory. Personally, I, I, I doubt this because that is taking the presence of Yehud back a thousand years before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that seems too early. Allahu A'lam. It seems too early for the entrance of the Yehud. But this is one theory. Now this was the first expulsion, the first diaspora. The second destruction of the temple. So eventually the emperor, uh, the future emperor becomes kind and he builds the temple again. But of course he builds it, so it's his structure, not Sulaiman's structure, right? So it's a, a, a fake imitation, a cheap imitation of the real structure. Nonetheless, it is a magnificent structure from his perspective. In other words, he does a good job, right? So he, uh, one of the emperors was basically, uh, took some uh, kindness on them and built a, a massive temple for them. This as well was about to be destroyed in a few decades. And this is yani, uh, the second destruction according to the majority of scholars uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, sent upon them. And this happened after the coming of Isa ibn Maryam. 
after the coming of Jesus Christ uh, under the Emperor Titus in 70 CE. Under the Emperor Titus in 70 uh, CE, there was a second destruction of the temple. And this led to a second diaspora, a second time that the Yehud uh, fled in many different areas. And there was a third, not destruction of the temple, but a third major diaspora when in 132 uh, CE, uh, a group of, of Jews decided to rebel against the ruler because the ruler uh, forced them to, I believe, uh, don't quote me here, I think that they were forced to commit shirk. I think the ruler wanted them to sacrifice a pig to an idol or something, so they revolted against this, right? So it was sacrilegious, and obviously uh, our sympathies are with them in this revolt. They revolted against the, the emperor with an armed revolt, and the emperor brutally slaughtered hundreds and thousands of them. He surrounded the city. Uh, he just basically massacred them. And this is the Emperor Hadrian. The Emperor Hadrian in 135. He didn't destroy the temple, but he slaughtered hundreds and thousands of Jews. And so they fled once again. It is said, and this seems to be, Allahu Alam, the one that makes the most sense, that this wave of immigrants, some of them running and fleeing helter and skelter, some of them wander down south into the Arabian Peninsula because Jerusalem is due north and they're just wandering down and they come across this fertile ground uh, that has lots of date palms. There are no inhabitants there at the time and they settle down over there. And this is the original Yathrib then, right? So the Yehud are the ones who actually found Yathrib according to this uh, narrative. And one group settles in Yathrib, another settles in Khaybar. And Yathrib and Khaybar are relatively close to each other, okay? One group settles in Yathir, another Khaybar, and it is also said another group continues down, and the largest of them continues down until they reach Yemen, right? And the Yemeni Jews were the largest quantity of Jews in the Arabian Peninsula, right? In fact, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, what did he tell Mu'adh? He said, you are going to go to a land that is Jews and Christians. The Ahli Kitab, right? And that is because in Yemen, there were there was a uh, Christian Himyarite kingdom, and they were Christians because Abraha had conquered parts of Yemen, and he had installed a governor there. A lot of people converted to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And the, Ye and the Jews were there from this expulsion. So Yemen was a land where there were a lot of Christians and Jews. Only Yemen, the only land in Arabia that had Christians and Jews. Yathrib, as we said, one theory these people who worked their way down to Yemen, one group of them settled in Yathrib and then the rest continued down, right? This is one uh, theory. Uh, yet another theory is the exact opposite. And that is, well not the exact opposite, the modified. And that is that the people of Yathrib are actually, the, the Jews of Yathrib are actually from the Jews of Medina. So the first theory has it that the people from Jerusalem are wandering down and small pockets remain in Yathrib, and the bulk goes to Yemen, right? The other theory has it the other way. And that is that from Yemen, small pockets emigrated. And they worked their way up. And so they, some of them ended up in Yathrib. Now in either case, and this is an interesting point, it establishes some type of relationship between Yemen and the Yehud. Correct? Either case, because the first batch, the first theory, they would have eventually found out that their relatives migrated to Yemen, correct? And the second theory, they are the descendants of the Yemeni Jews, correct? So both of these theories link them to Yemen, and in my humble opinion, this makes complete sense as we're going to come to now. This makes complete sense and it fits in perfectly as we're going to come to now. Uh, a tangent here, some modern researchers looking at the reports of the Jews in Medina and seeing what they had of institutions and trying to find phrases that are found in Arabic that the Jews used, right? This is a very meticulous research. You're trying to reconstruct who these Jews were. So some researchers have a theory that the Jews of Medina were not from the sects of mainstream Judaism. They were from a very ancient sect called the Karaites, K-A-R-A-I-T-E, Karaites. Pause here. You should be aware that Judaism has many sects, as we all know. We in America are only used to three of them, the conservative, the reform, and, and orthodox. 
The Hasidics are a branch of the Orthodox. The conservative, the reform, and the Orthodox. Uh, these three sects are completely modern. They go back a hundred years in America. It has nothing to do with classical Judaism. So we can ignore all of this for classical Judaism. Classical Judaism, uh, we, not, we don't want to talk about the sects of Judaism, that's a different class altogether, but realize there were two main streams once upon a time. Two main streams. The first of them was called Rabbinic Judaism. And all of the Jewish groups in our times go back to Rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism, look at it as the Jews who are required to follow the rabbis. Rabbinic. So the rabbis interpret the law and they follow the rabbis. Uh, the second group of Judaism, of Jews, and this is the theory that this group is from that second group, are the Karaites. By the way, in our times, the Karaites are only 40,000 in the whole world. They are very minuscule, and it, I have never met one in my life. Uh, uh, they're a very small group. They're still around. The Karaites reject the authority of the rabbis. And they say, we need to follow the Torah directly. We're not going to have the intermediary of the rabbis. We're going to follow the Torah directly. Now, this is a bit simplistic, but uh, the point is that uh, there is something called Rabbinic Judaism, which has, call it, look, at it, look at it this way, books of fiqh. The Rabbinic Jews are going to follow books of fiqh. They're not going to go back to the Quran and Sunnah, being equivalent here, right? The Karaite Jews reject these books. Like, this is not the original Sharia. The actual Sharia is the Kitab and Sunnah, the Quran and Sunnah, right? So they're going to go back directly to the Quran and Sunnah. This is Karaite Judaism. Now, uh, the point being, some scholars have tried to research this, and it appears that the Jews of Medina were Karaites. If this is the case, then we can say that the theory that they emigrated when uh, when uh, they were expelled from Jerusalem makes sense because that was the time when Karaite Judaism was predominant. Rabbinic Judaism began around 4-500 CE and the expulsion took place 70-120 CE. This is, you see why we're, we're interested in what type of Jews they are. Because Rabbinic Judaism, after 400 CE, the bulk of Jews are Rabbinic Juda Jews. So these Jews have nothing to do with Rabbinic Judaism. So therefore, they arrived in Yathrib before 400 CE. Therefore, this adds weight to the fact that they are from the expulsion of uh, Hadrian and, and, and Titus. You guys following me? I'm, I'm going a totally different tangent, but this is the introduction to a very important series of topics uh, afterwards. Now... Allahu A'lam, I also have an opinion, and may Allah Azza wa forgive me for daring to have an opinion, uh, but at the same time, with all humbleness and modesty, very few people try to study the seerah also looking at other sources, like Western sources, Roman sources, Greek sources, other sources that we can find things about. And this is unfortunately one of the problems that very few people are doing it in this manner. You either have people who are not Muslim, who reject the Quran and Sunnah, and rely completely on these sources, and then you have Muslims who are not even aware of the other sources, and they completely rely on this. We have a lot of information from other sources, and we're trying to piece together a picture. Allahu alam, I have a little bit of a theory in this regard. Take it or leave it. And that is that. The question is very interesting. There were three famous Jewish tribes of Medina. You should memorize these names. We're going to keep coming up over and over again. The Banu Qaynuqa, the Banu Nadir, and the Banu Qurayza. Okay? Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir, Banu Qurayza. Okay? Question. Jews do not divide themselves into these types of tribes. Jews don't have tribes. This is an Arab phenomenon. Jews do not have tribes. They were considered, now if somebody says the 12 tribes of Israel, that was ancient. This is now long gone. Even in the time of the expulsions, there weren't these tribes anymore. That was ancient. In the time of, in the time of Dawood, in the time of Musa and, and Harun, yes, they had the 12 tribes of Bani Israel, right? But this, they just merged together. They just, they did not continue that tradition. And they became one nation, one ethnic group, right? So the question arises, how did these Jews of Yathrib get divided up into three tribes when, if the story is correct, they're all coming from one area and settling in Yathrib? It doesn't make sense for them to be three separate tribes and these three tribes were having battles with each other in the wars of Bu'ath. In other words, there's a civil war taking place between the Arabs and between the Jews. In this civil war, 
The Aus is on one side, the Khazraj is on the other. And the Jewish tribes themselves are divided and fighting each other. You see the, the problem here, right? If they were one unit, one group of people, how come they're divided into tribes and how come there's a civil war? You understand the question here, right? So the theory that I have, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, is that there's an element of truth in more than one of these stories. And these three tribes represent three different emigrations of the Yehud to Yathrib. Three different time zones. And therefore, when each time, when each new group arrives, they're not considered part of the old one because this is now completely bro broken away. Right. And so, this is one theory, and again, I don't know anybody who has suggested this, but there is very little discussion in the Islamic sources of the origin of these tribes anyway. If you look at Ibn Ishaq, no mention at all where these Jews come from. Look at Ibn. So, this is not something that people are thinking about where all of these people uh, come from. Nonetheless, this is one theory. And Allah knows best, and we're never going to know unless we find external information, but it does make sense that there must be some reason why these three tribes were separate from one another. That's the theory I have. Now, this is the first group of people, the Yehud. The second group of people are the Arabs. The Arabs were themselves two tribes. Now, alhamdulillah, we know the Arab tribes. The Arab tribes, their lineage is mapped out. And by the way, some modern groups of scholars, they actually even denied that there were real Jews in Medina. Some modern uh, non-Muslim scholars, they denied this. Why? Many reasons, but perhaps some of them felt embarrassed that this happened to the Jews. So they said, these weren't real Jews. Who were they? They were Arab converts to Judaism. They weren't, you know, in the Jewish religion, you have to be ethnically, uh, uh, your mother has to be a Jew, right, to, for you to be considered a Jew. So if you're a convert, then most Orthodox groups of Judaism don't consider you, in fact, all of them, don't consider you really to be a Jew. So there is a theory that these Jewish tribes were not actually Jewish. That they were Arab converts to Judaism. This is a ridiculous theory for one simple reason. If they were Arab converts, we would know their lineage. We would know where they're coming from. The Arabs, whatever they did, they preserved their lineage. And these three tribes appear out of nowhere. There is no connection with Adnan and Qahtan at all. So when there's no connection, we have connections with every single Arab tribe to Adnan or Qahtan. Remember we talked way back about the two main uh, founders of the Arabs, right? Adnan and Qahtan. We have every single tribe you can think of. The Kinda, the Kinana, the Thaqif, the Quraysh. We can trace it all the way back. As for the Qaynu, even the names, by the way, Qaynu, Qa and Qurayla, these are not names that are familiar to the, uh, the Arabs. They're not, they're, they're Judah, Jewishized Arab names. So, the, the theory that they are converts holds no weight because there is no lineage. And all Arabs have a lineage to these two. Now, the original settlers therefore in this land were Yehud. Where did the Arabs come from and who are the Arabs? The, the Aus and the Khazraj. The Aus and the Khazraj, we know much more about them because they're Arabs. So when we're talking about Arabs, we can map out the lineage. The Aus and the Khazraj, they are descendants of Qahtan. Qahtan, Adnan is the Prophet's ancestor. Right? Remember, go all the way back. There were two major uh, founders of uh, what we now call Arabs, Adnan and Qahtan. Right? And generally speaking, Qahtan was more southern and Adnan was more central, generally speaking. And uh, Ismail's descendants mixed with Adnan and his uh, descendants. And so the Prophet and the Quraysh are called Adnanis. And Qahtan is the other major uh, tribe. Now, the bulk of Middle Arabia, Hijaz, is Adnani. Quraysh is Adnan, Thaqif is Adnan. All of these tribes are Adnani. In fact, the only group of Qahtani Arabs in the whole region is in Yathrib. And as I said last Wednesday, yani clearly, again, we cannot be 100% sure, we don't speak on behalf of Allah, but it does appear that this was what Allah Azza intended. That the Qahtani and the, and the Adnani tribes would merge together in early Islam to show the, the real unity. That there would be no more animosity be, between Qahtani and Adnani. That anybody who opposed the Muslims could not do so on ethnic grounds. And this was the precursor to unite all of the Arabs. Right? Yani out of all of the tribes, the Prophet Sallallahu is Adnani and he settles in Qahtani and uh, the two come together under the banner of Islam. It seems more than just a coincidence is the point. It seems Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended this. So where did these Qahtani come from? What are they doing here if they live in Yemen? 
Here we go back to the story of Qahtani Arabs. Don't worry, I'm not going to bore you too much. If this is boring, personally, I find this very interesting, but people are different. Some people don't like this ancient history. Qahtanis, the, the people of Yemen, if you like, uh, the Aws and the Khazraj go back to the city of Ma'rab. And Ma'rab is the people of Saba. The people of Saba. You know Saba is mentioned in the Quran. There's a surah in the Quran, Surah Saba, right? The people of Saba, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions them in the Quran, and Allah mentions one thing about them that is an amazing feat that the whole world knows about them. And that is they were the first human beings ever to build a dam. Never before had a dam been built. And uh, by the way, that dam still stands to this day. It is, what, 2,000, 3,000 years old? It's just an, not all of it, but you see uh, still to this day, outside the city of Ma'rab, you will still see uh, uh, the dam. And this dam was a feat of engineering. It blocked up the waters so that there could be uh, rivers flowing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, لَقَدَ كَانَ لِسَبَأٍ فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةً جَنَّتَانِ عَنْ يَمِينٍ وَالشِّمَالٍ Allah blessed them like He hardly blessed anybody else at that time. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. And they had rivers flowing from this dam, and the, the rivers gave them beautiful gardens. You know, there were gardens that on the right and the left of the city, and it was a beautiful place. And then Allah punished them. How did He punish them? The dam collapsed. This is Sayl al Arim. Sayl al Arim is the, the Arim dam collapsing. Sayl is the, 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 the water flowing, right? Sayl al Arimi. So, because of their insolence and their arrogance, they were punished and the dam collapsed. And this led to, again, hundreds and thousands of people dying, many villages destroyed, and many other Yemenis had to migrate away. And this occurred most likely around 300 CE. Most likely around 300 CE. So, uh, around three centuries before the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, 250 years before the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, the uh, Ma'rab dam, dam collapses, and Allah references in the Quran, Sayyid al-Arim, and so groups of Yemenites have to emigrate. Now, here is where I go back to what I initially said. Some of them, Aws and Khazraj, were cousin tribes. They literally go back to the same person. Aws and Khazraj were cousin tribes. Uh, so there is some blood relationship. So we can understand why the two are together. So Aws and Khazraj, they end up in Yathrib. Why Yathrib? Again, nobody knows. But this is all theory. Again, take it or leave it. But there's no, nothing wrong with giving theories and Allah knows the truth. If we say that the Yahud of Medina had relationships with Yemen, it makes complete sense for the Yemeni Qahtanis to be aware of an established settlement. That has nothing to do with the Adnanis. Because remember, there's animosity between Adnan and Qahtan. Right? There always was tension. Up until the time of the Prophet there was tension. In fact, even the Hilf al-Fudul that took place, it was a war between Adnanis and Qahtanis. Up until that time, they were still fighting. Right? So, if there was some relationship between Yemen and those Yahud, and I gave the theory that there is, then it makes complete sense that the Aws and the Khazraj would have known, again, these were, there were some travelers, whatnot, they would have known of a group of Jews. They would have felt comfortable being with them because they're already comfortable with Jews in Yemen. Perhaps even there was some trading. Allah knows, again, this is who's going to have records in 300 CE. Who's going to have, you know, this is all theories that we're going to have. But the question still, and the, it's an unanswered question, why Yathrib? How did the Aws and Khazraj end up in Yathrib? And there's already Yahud over there. Unless there was some type of relationship beforehand. You see my, my theory here, right? Some type of knowledge beforehand. So the Aws and the Khazraj settled down in Yathrib and the two of them benefited each other. The two of them benefited each other. How so? Uh, the Yahud were skilled in agriculture, in weaving. Uh, of course, they, they were businessmen. Uh, the Arabs had knowledge of war. The Arabs had knowledge of the language. And so the Arabs Arabicized the Jews, i.e. the language became theirs, right? The culture became theirs. They're living in Arabia. So all of the Jews began speaking fluent Arabic. Now they still spoke Hebrew, by the way. We know this from the seerah. 
We know this from the seerah, and obviously it's understood. I mean, any minority retains its language for many uh, generations, you know, uh, especially when you're in the middle of the desert. So they retain their, their, their Hebrew, but they spoke fluent Arabic as well. And they took on the culture of the Arabs, and the language of the Arabs, and the dress of the Arabs with some, uh, yani, you know, Yehudi as well uh, influence, but they kept much of their, their uh, culture, and they adopted Arab culture. So, when the Qahtanis, the Yemenis, the Aus and the Khazraj arrived in Yathrib, it appears that they didn't arrive together. And again, this is a theory. Nobody was an eyewitness writing chronicles of 300 CE, i.e. 200 before the Hijrah. Right, 250 before the Hijrah. Who's going to be recording this? The theory goes as follows. Now, we know for a fact that the Aus had asked permission from the Banu Quraidha and the Banu Nadir, the two Yehudi tribes, and formed an alliance with them. And the Khazraj had uh, taken permission from the Banu Qaynuqa. So the question once again arises, how come these two Jewish tribes, sorry, these two Arab tribes, have different Jewish alliances? The theory, the two of them didn't arrive at the same time, maybe 10-15 years apart, or a few years apart. That the first tribe arrived, and that is the Aus. And the Aus got the alliances and took some protection from the largest of the Yehudi tribes, and that is the Banu Quraidha and the Banu Nadir. And this also explains why the Aus were richer. Because the Aus were richer than the Khazraj, and the Aus had a higher uh, income. They were socioeconomically better off, and they occupied the better land of Medina. Because in those days, land was also tribal. You, your house was where your tribe was. It's not like in our times, anybody buys any. No, you lived where your tribe was for protection, for safety. So the Aus had the best plots in Medina, the most luscious gardens of Medina, and the Khazraj had the lower territories, the ones that were not as luscious. So, uh, therefore, it appears that the Aus arrived before, and one theory goes, the Yehud needed manual labor. They needed people to uh, basically farm the land. It's too large for them. And so they allowed the Aus the opportunity to basically, uh, what's going to be a good word here, not rent to own, not lease to own, but basically fraction it out. You take charge of the land, you give us a fraction, and you take the rest, right? Uh, it's basically, yani you do the manual labor, and you give us a percentage uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the produce, and uh, you can basically my, uh, man the land and take charge of it. So uh, the Aus and the Khazraj therefore settled down in this manner, and over the course of the next 150, 200 years, this solidified the relationship. The Aus and the Khazraj had their alliances with the Yehud, and each of them had wars with each other, and therefore when the civil wars took place, and I said the civil wars lasted for more than 100 years, the civil wars lasted for more than 100 years. The worst of them was the Bu'ath War, which took place five years before the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is also known that uh, the Jewish tribes uh, financed the Aus on the one side, the Banu Nadir, and the Banu Qaynuqa financed the uh, Khazraj on the other side. So they actually uh, were involved in the civil war. Right? Did they actually fight or not? We don't have references. But there was clear, clearly a divide between the Jewish tribes. And the two Jewish tribes were helping uh, different sides, the Aus and the uh, Khazraj. Now, question arises, the number of people living in Medina, how many? Very difficult. There was no census. Nobody's going to go house to house and see how many people, right? But we can kind of sort of get a glimmer. Kind of sort of. How, how so? Well, by looking at the battles of Badr and Uhud and Khandaq, seeing how slowly but surely the city is growing. The total population of the three Jewish tribes seems to have been around 2,000 men. We get this by doing a tally of Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa, and Banu Quraidha, each time something happens, we have a number roughly of men. Adding all of these men together, 2,000 men. Multiply that by three for women and children, you get 6,000 Jews, roughly, in Yathrib. When the Prophet immigrates, roughly 6,000. We also know that in the conquest of Mecca, the Ansar had around four to 5,000 men participating in the conquest. Right? So, 
four to five thousand multiplied again by average of three, you have twelve to fifteen thousand Arabs. So quantity wise, the Arabs seem to be double the Jews. But the Jews had the power because they had the money and because they had the land. The best land and because they had fortresses. The Aus and the Khazraj did not build fortresses. The Jews did not live in Medina proper. They lived outside. And they had fortresses, each of these uh, three. And so a rough quantity we get of the people of Medina, roughly around 20,000 people. And this is a relatively large town. It's not a small town for the time. To have 20,000 people seems to be a very good number. And we already said that the Yehud were more, sorry, the Arabs were more than the uh, Yehud. Uh, we just have one narration we have time for and then it is uh, uh, time for Dr. Bashar to make a presentation. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bashar, we can go uh, late because Aisha is just starting in 10 minutes so you can go for 20 minutes, inshallah, not a problem, inshallah. Uh, and the final thing that uh, we just want to mention here is uh, we talked about the demographics and I need to now basically go back to where we left off from the story of the seerah, connect the demographics in Medina to the story of the seerah, and the next lesson we start talking about the Prophet's uh, first few days in Medina. And so we conclude today by talking about the Prophet's arrival in the city of Yathrib. That when we, we had already talked about uh, Suraqa ibn Malik, we had talked about uh, the, the story of Umm Ma'bad, we had talked about the number of people who converted along the way, and now the news has spread that the Prophet is about to arrive, and so every single day, the Ansar would go outside of the city towards what is now Quba, waiting for the Prophet to come, because he, they know it's only a matter of time now. And Every day they would go there in the morning and wait until around 10, 11 o'clock when the sun got too hot. And then they would have to go back and uh, go to sleep because it was too hot. And so one day they went in the morning waiting and nothing happened and they came back by 10, 11 o'clock. And in the distance the Prophet and Abu Bakr appeared but there were no Ansar there because they were already back home in their houses. And it so happened that one of the Yehud because they were the ones on the outskirts and because they were the ones who had that plot of land. One of the, uh, 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 the Jewish men was on the top of the, the tree plucking the dates. So he was the first to see in the distance the Prophet and Abu Bakr coming. And the excitement of waiting for the Prophet was so immense that it had even uh, affected the Jews. I mean, it's an exciting thing. It's about to happen. And this is the case in any community that anything is happening. Everybody feels happy about it. So the Jews, the Jew became so happy, he cried out at the top of his lungs that, Oh Arabs, your king has arrived. Notice, he knows that they have adopted, quote unquote, the Prophet as their king. Or, oh Arabs, your king has arrived. And he too is excited. And notice he says, your kings. Because from the beginning, they did not expect the Prophet to be their, forget prophet, even ruler. And there was going to be tensions to come. Because he didn't say my king. He said, your king has arrived. He's excited because everybody's waiting. But he doesn't ascribe it to himself. Because that's not, he, they, they felt that till, um, until this point, they always felt that that's their business, we have our business, they will not interfere in our business, but slowly but surely, that did happen. And so, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when the news spread, the Ansar rushed out in hordes, hundreds and hundreds of them, and the Prophet ﷺ entered, uh, according to one report, on the 2nd of Rabi'ul Awwal, according to another, on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, on a Monday, in the 14th year of the Da'wah, which was to become the first year of the uh, Hijrah. And Al-Bara ibn Azim narrates in Sahih Muslim, that I saw the Ansar all dressed up, coming out. In other words, as soon as they heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they actually dressed up in good clothes to come and to greet him. And over 500 men came outside, all of them armed, meaning to as a welcoming committee, armed and dressed, and they accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The women climbed up onto the houses, the children are thronging around to see, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is surrounded by literally hundreds, if not thousands of people, all of whom believe in him, all of whom are happy that he is uh, coming and for the first time we get a glimmer of hope changes in the air it's not like Mecca where he's persecuted where he's tortured for the first time there's excitement there's buzz there's there's a freshness happening that for the first time people in the hundreds and thousands are thronging to welcome him to to greet him we, we can we can sense the the joy 
the vibrancy, the change in the air, we can sense that a new tide is coming, that the change has begun, that the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will signal a new era. And this is the seed of the first Islamic nation and the story of its nurturing and its expansion and its flourishing will inshallah ta'ala be the story of the Madani's seerah, the Madani seerah, and that inshallah ta'ala we will resume uh, in our next seerah class. Uh, I will now hand over to uh, Dr. Bashar. Uh, one final point, I will not be here next Wednesday. Uh, I will be abroad, so the Sira class will be resumed two Wednesdays from now. Uh, so we'll get an email, and then inshallah, two Wednesdays from now, we'll resume the Sira class. Dr. Bashar, the floor is all yours. Uh, we already announced the Isha timing uh, from the 1st of April will be 9 p.m. Isha from the 1st of April, 9 p.m., inshallah. Take a couple of questions until we set up. Oh, okay. Any questions while they set up the PowerPoint? You have any announcements as well? Can we move your phone? Yeah, sure. Whatever you want to do. Any questions? Uh. All of this will come. I don't want to be hasty. Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynu Qa'a. Banu Qurayza, each one of them has a long story. And we need to be very careful and cautious. We need to explain the details and rationale. So, when it come, the time comes, yes. There's no clear indication that the Jews uh, were looking for the next Messiah. Uh, no, the, 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 the Quran itself references they're waiting for the next prophet. I mean, and Medina. Yes, the Quran references this. But they expected that Prophet to be one of their own. They didn't expect him to be uh, someone else. The Quran references this in Surah Al Baqarah. I think it's verse 130, 140 something. It's in that area. That uh, Allah says they were expecting a victory over the Aus and the Khazraj. And uh, the Aus and the Khazraj say that. Whenever we had a war, right, the Yahud would tell us that it's only a matter of time before our Prophet comes and will massacre you. So they're waiting for a Prophet. According to our legends and sources, they are waiting for a Prophet. Does it answer your question? I mean, in Medina. <laughs> yes, in Medina. They're waiting for a Prophet in Medina. Yes. Yes. <laughs> This is the theory that is given, and that is that just like Salman al Farisi knew that one of the signs of the Prophet is what? That he's going to come in a land of dates, right? So, this, this knowledge was known. We know this for a fact, it was known. Why shouldn't these Yahud have it as well? They probably also had it. And so, there, again, it doesn't negate the theory that when they're fleeing from Hadrian or from Titus, they settle in a land of dates because they know that the Prophet will come in a land of dates. Right? Inshallah. Yes. Uh, what was the relationship between Biba in Medina and Biba in One of the, uh, th uh, the uh, specialities of the people of Medina is that they had never been conquered by any tribe, even though two, three times this was attempted. But they had never been conquered by any tribe. So there was a relationship of Izzah. People would come, trade, and leave. There was never a conquering. So the Aus and Khazraj were uh, independent in spirit. Okay? Zakmullah khair. We will continue, inshallah, next, uh, not next Wednesday, two Wednesdays from now, inshallah. Bismillah.